The reading this morning is from Matthew 25, and it's the first 13 verses. There's two readings. The parable of the ten virgins. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I don't know you. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. And the second reading is from Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 19. A call to persevere. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Well, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be with you today. As we open up God's word this morning, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we humbly ask that by your spirit, you would come alongside us now, that you would teach us, and that indeed our hearts would burn within us as we turn to your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As Emma's mentioned, we conclude our series today looking at some of those aspects that we are called to as a church and this week called to grow. Surveys show that in the UK, the general adult population has a very positive perception of Jesus. Sadly, though, the UK wide church is viewed much less positively, in some cases more of a hindrance than a help to spiritual growth. And although some of those views might be ill-informed, it remains very much a challenge to us. How are we to be a church where folk can come along and grow in their walk with Jesus? Or in terms of our mission statement, how can we be a community where everyone can encounter the transforming love of Jesus? As I was preparing this talk, the two themes of growth and community have very much sort of merged together. So we might equally have entitled this talk, Call to Community. And in some sense, we've been looking at being a community already over the last few weeks. Serving, sacrifice, praying, giving, being a safe space and loving are all aspects of being a thriving, vibrant church community. Well, our second reading today was taken from the book of Hebrews. We don't know who wrote the letter, but we know it's written to a group of Jewish Christians. The group had been around for a while and they had suffered a history of persecution. They should have been mature Christians by this time, capable of teaching others but we read that they're not. They also seem to have half a mind to return to Judaism 
And so the writer delivers this powerful letter to them, including today's reading, which very much speaks into this theme of called to grow. So do grab a Bible and let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 25 together. And I'm going to bring out four key growth themes. Growth with one another, growth in the right environment, growth in the light of Advent, and growth with confidence. Firstly, as we read this passage, the whole theme of being a community jumps out. We look together at verses 24 and 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. So twice the writer urges this mutuality, interacting one with another, being in fellowship with one another, spurring one another on and encouraging one another. These two one another's are just two of the one another's in the Bible. Astonishingly, there are over 50 such phrases in the Bible. At the pinnacle, we have the words of Jesus on that last evening before he went to the cross. He turned to the, to the disciples, a new commandment I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. How does that love find expression? Other New Testament letters show us that we are to accept one another, be kind and compassionate to one another, to pray for each other, to build one another up, to teach and admonish one another and to serve one another. And so you see our lives are not meant to be lived in isolation. Yes, our personal times of prayer and Bible reading are absolutely vital. But as Christians, we're also meant to come together. We live out our faith with one another and we become glued together into Christian community. The late American pastor Tim Keller says that Christian community is like a bunch of grapes. We are organically related to one another in community. Members' lives touching each other as we live together, learn together and pray together. And this is what happens as we meet with one another, as we pray for each other, as we build each other up as we bear each other's burdens, so in God's strength, by the power of his spirit, we grow in faith and Christian maturity. And we all have a part to play. Paul compared the church, the, the body of Christ, to the human body, explaining the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Every member of the body of Christ God's family is essential and valuable. Not only that, God has given the members of his body spiritual gifts for the common good. These gifts are to be used for the building up of the church until we reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ as Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. So as the body of Christ, the writer encourages the Hebrews, let us not give up meeting together. Here we're reminded firstly of the importance of meeting with one another, not in the sense of, of coming along just to get a tick in the school register, but meeting together, coming together, and allowing our lives to intertwine, loving one another as Jesus commanded. But secondly, it sort of takes me back to the, 
visit of Andy Worthington from Open Doors a few weeks ago. You may remember he shared, didn't he, about how far Christians around the world will go in terms of risk and danger in order to meet together. And also just how challenging it must be for those who find themselves through persecution, isolated, without the support of fellow Christians locally. So meeting together, allowing God to minister in us and through us with one another by his spirit is then how we can grow and help others grow in faith and Christian maturity. That meeting together can take, though, many forms. And Patrick has shared in the past a sort of pyramid, if you like, of, of meeting opportunities. At the smallest scale, meeting with a prayer partner or prayer triplet, two or three folk committed to praying with each other on a regular basis. I know several of you do this and find it very valuable. For those doing the prayer course at the moment, um, in the session we in our home group saw this week, Pete Gregg was highlighting how good it is to have one or two really good Christian friends who we can really share with, especially during those hard times in life. Then there's the home groups, and it's been great to pray for the home group leaders this morning. Meeting with a a set group of people, typically six to ten, where we give space to help one another, support one another, teach one another and journey with each other through life. Then there's the bigger bigger church gatherings, much bigger groups of people, having the whole sense of being a large local community of Christians, where we can build a breadth of relationships, where we can worship together and access things like courses. And then on a much bigger scale, sort of countrywide, there are Christian conferences, where we can connect into the UK-wide church, meeting and sharing with others across the country. So as 2024 approaches, what might meeting together mean for you? Why not start a prayer partnership or a prayer triplet? Why not join a home group or make home group a much higher priority in your week? How about going to a Christian conference such as Spring Harvest at Easter time? All great ways in which we can grow with one another. Secondly, growth in the right environment. Some of you I know are very keen gardeners. I'm afraid to say that I didn't inherit my dad's green fingers. But we know, don't we? that for plants to grow, they thrive in the best environment. And we see in verses 24 and 25 of our Hebrews passage, two aspects of being a community that help people grow. Firstly, we should be considering others, verse 24, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. So consider that the writer is urging the readers to be intentional in their outlook. They should be considering, they should be looking, thinking through, where can I help? Who needs my support and encouragement? It's interesting that there isn't an exhaustive list of do's and don'ts, but more like You consider, you think it through. How do I support that person I haven't seen at church for a while? How do I help that person I know who is having a difficult time? How do I share my joy at someone else's really good news? What are my gifts and where is God calling me to use them? And being urged to to consider others also challenges our sometimes egocentric outlook. It's not about me, but about others. And we saw in the summer, didn't we, Paul writing to the Philippians, each of you should look not only to your own interests, 
but also to the interests of others. The second right environment is that we should be spurring each other on and encouraging one another. I wonder where your mind goes when you hear the word encouragement, perhaps to a a loving parent coaxing and supporting through a, a particular challenge or a kind school teacher giving us the confidence we need as we seek to learn, saying, yes, you can do it. I'm mindful of the the fleet half marathon, the streets lined with people clapping and calling out words of encouragement, especially in those last few miles. Keep going. You're almost there. Well done. Well, how do we encourage one another? I'm sure you can can think of many ways, phoning someone to have a catch up, sharing uplifting words with someone, acknowledging the the positive changes you see in someone, telling someone how they inspired you, thanking someone, letting someone know you're praying for them, giving someone a sincere compliment. The list is endless. So, growth in the right environment. Let me invite you to spend some time in the week ahead considering who needs your encouragement. Thirdly, growth in the light of Advent. The writer to the Hebrews stresses, verse 25, that the importance of meeting together and encouraging one another is heightened by the approaching day. And all the more as you see the day approaching. This is that marvellous day when Jesus will appear for a second time and complete his work of new creation. And this is, of course, what, what we reflect on at this time of Advent, remembering his first coming, but also looking forward to that day when he will come again. But why does the writer write all the more? What is it about that approaching day that prompts this extra effort? Well, our first reading was taken from Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 to 13, the parable of the ten virgins. And this is the first of three parables in that chapter on Christian living in the light of Christ's return. The other two are perhaps the ones you're more familiar with, the parable of the talents and the parable of the sheep and the goats. Jesus tells these three parables to teach his disciples and us about the practicalities of living as we await that day of his return. In the parable of the ten virgins, although the bridegroom was a long while in coming, some were prepared for his arrival and others not. Jesus' conclusion, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. So in the three parables, Jesus speaks of the need to be watchful, to be prepared, to be holy, to be faithful of the certainty of judgment and that at the heart of Christianity is developing a relationship with Jesus, which shows itself in loving, sacrificial care for others. These are all huge challenges to how we do that. And the writer to the Hebrews is saying, in the light of that approaching day, it is even more important that we meet together and encourage one another. Fourthly, growth with confidence. Well, very briefly, our Hebrews passage, verses 19 to 23, opens up with some wonderful words of encouragement. As Jewish Christians, their Jewish heritage would have taught them that the earthly presence of God was to be found in that place, the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle of Moses and later in the temple in Jerusalem. 
a, a place where no one was allowed to enter except the high priest who went into it once a year. Accessing the presence of God was limited on account of the barrier between man's sin and God's holiness. And the writer to the Hebrews explains to them, this has all changed. We can have confidence. We can come and draw near to God because by his death on the cross, Jesus has cleansed us from all that we have done wrong and made us pure so that we can indeed come into the presence of God who is holy. This is the wonder of the good news of Jesus and it has an an astonishing impact on our Christian growth and maturity. Sometimes there are things which hold us back, which somehow make us feel as if we are imprisoned. We may feel we have let God down. We may be burdened by guilt from past mistakes. We may feel afraid of what God might ask us to do. But the writer is saying, draw near to God. Come to him with confidence, not in ourselves, but in Jesus. What did Charles Wesley write in his great hymn? Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flame with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth and followed thee. So at this Advent time, let's rejoice at the coming of Jesus Let's be thankful that because of Jesus, we can draw near to God with confidence and full assurance of faith. Let's recommit ourselves one to another, to growing with one another, to actively considering how we can support and encourage one another. And let's be watchful as we approach that wonderful day when Jesus will come again. Amen.